Hello everyone and welcome to the session. As part of this session, we will talk about deep learning. And obviously, when we talk about deep learning, that would be neural network. And I'm in Hyderabad office today. Uh, we have classroom-based training in Hyderabad. People who are in Hyderabad might want to come down. If, if you weren't uh, well notified, then let me tell you that tomorrow also it will be a classroom-based training in Hyderabad only. So you can come and we can have a face-to-face you know, -face conversation as well. So let us proceed further. Off late, out of all the machine learning algorithms, deep learning algorithms have become extremely famous. So we have artificial intelligence systems which are being built. And we built AI applications using data science concepts. Within data science, you have data mining. Within data mining, you have machine learning. Within machine learning, we have something called as deep learning. So deep learning algorithms deep learning algorithms include neural networks. Hmm. Are you not able to hear me, friends? Or people who are online, are you not able to see the screen? Can you all please confirm? Are you able to hear me? First, let me answer. Are you able to hear me? Okay. Let me see. Okay. Ah, just give me one. I understand now because I was connected to an inappropriate person. So we have deep learning libraries, uh, algorithms. Within deep learning algorithms, we have something called as neural networks. Okay. And Let us talk about deep learning primer. We will try to understand all the basics of neural network algorithms. And once we talk about that, we will also discuss a few other neural network algorithms which exist. However, let me give you a brief. You know, probably I will talk about this a couple of times. First, when you have structured data, We use something called as artificial neural network algorithm. When we have unstructured data, that is when we have videos or images to deal with, people use something called as convolution neural network. When we have audio data, that's a different ballgame altogether. But then when you have textual data, people use RNN and its variants, recurrent neural network and its variants. When, when we deal with videos and images, people also used uh, also use R CNN models region CNN models, wherein we have mask RCNN, fast RCNN, faster RCNN, YOLO models, you only look once, so on and so forth. When it comes to dealing with textual data, we have RNNs, LSTM models, gated recurrent units, and now we have transformers. Within transformers, 
we have BERT, GPT model, and now OPT from Facebook. These are also part of your advanced NLP techniques, advanced natural processing techniques. And you have other techniques such as GANs, generative adversarial networks, wherein if I just type the name of the image, for example, if I say white elephant, image of the white elephant will come up. So it will automatically generate images. That is why it is called as generative adversarial network. You can compose new music. You can come up with new songs. You can come up with new movie scripts, etc. using generative adversarial networks. Then we have something called as auto encoders, which is used to reduce the size of the data into smaller size. You can think about this as dimension reduction techniques such as principal component analysis or singular value decomposition or factor analysis. All these are dimension reduction techniques. You have a lot of variants pertaining to auto encoders as well. Then we have something called as reinforcement learning. Within which deep Q network Deep QDNN, deep neural network, is very famous. Okay, and also there are other techniques on how to deal with your images, how to build your chatbot, so on and so forth. The more you know, the more you can command as part of your salaries. Okay. So let's get into the first discussion. Scientists thought that human brain does a lot of multitasking. For example, if you're driving your car, you change your gears, you apply brakes, you look at the traffic signal, you probably would be on call simultaneously. So human brain does many things in parallel. And human brain does it perfectly. So people started studying the biological human brain to understand how does a human brain look like? And what if we can replicate exactly the same thing? What would happen if we replicate exactly the same thing? Right? If you replicate the same thing and try to come up with an artificial neural network, which will be which is going to be similar to human brain then people thought it would be as powerful as a human brain. And that was when your artificial neural network research started. First of all, let us understand a few more things about human brain. A basic unit of information processing is called as neuron. This is called as, I mean, this is human brain. This is how it looks like. And you'll have a lot of folds. People who have more folds supposedly have better IQ level. That is what research has proven. But nothing can beat hard work. Okay, nothing can actually beat hard work. Right? Okay. Number of total number of uh, sorry total number of neurons that we have in a human brain happens to be ten raised to the power eleven. And on an average we are going to have 1,000 to 10,000 connections. Though we have 10 raised to the power 11 neurons, on an average, 1,000 to 10,000 neurons would be interconnected. And the communication between the various neurons happens at a rapid pace, okay, to the order of a few milliseconds. And even if you have a very complex task, and if it is perpetual, Perpetual, uh, perceptual means if you are going to do it again and again, repetitive tasks, then supposedly um, it will take less than a few milliseconds to complete the task for your decision making. 
and also it is not going to cross more than 100 neurons out of 10 raised to the power 11 neurons how many neurons would you be making use of 100 neurons only so that means even if you feel that data science is difficult deep learning is difficult if you keep reading the same thing again and again if you keep doing the same programming again and again you'll be making use of hardly 100 neurons okay that's the point and what will you do with the remaining neurons will you just keep it idle Right. So, never assume that this is difficult, that is difficult, etc. Right? These are all very trivial things. We are not coming up with new algorithms. We are learning algorithms which someone else has already built. Okay. And with a neural network, we have something called as compositionality. Compositionality means First, human brain, right? The moment, for example, say you're looking at this water bottle. First, you look at the pixels. Then human brain recognizes the edges. Then there is something called as text on, motif. Then the part, then the entire object. When it comes to text, you first look at each character, then the word, then group of words, then the clause then the sentence, and then the entire story. Same is the case with speech as well. This is called as compositionality, and this is exactly how the human brain works. And neural network is based on research done on the human brain. So people thought our neural network algorithm should act in a similar manner as that of your human brain okay so that is the reason why people came up with compositionality i'll talk more about compositionality later but let's look at this if you have an image and if you supply your image to your neural network algorithm there will be something called as layers for example you have your input which you're giving And then you'll have hidden layers, and then you'll have the output. First hidden layer will capture low level features. Next hidden layer captures mid level features. Next hidden layer captures high level features. And finally, you'll have the classifier and then the output. Okay, and low level features, if you, if you look at this, is trying to capture probably the edges, some kind of edges. It is very difficult to understand what features are being captured exactly, but still we are making an effort to understand what features are captured by the initial set of hidden layers, low level features, meaning you will have edges in the car, okay, all these edges are getting captured then the mid-level features probably the tire okay um, probably the mesh here and the grill so on and so forth and then high level features is capturing some additional information and finally it is classifying that this image that you have supplied happens to be a car Let's take yet another example to understand the compositionality aspects of deep learning. When you supply, say, human faces, first of all, you'll have input layer. Then you have the first hidden layer. This is called as hidden layer. The first set of hidden layer will capture what information? Low level information. Low level means detailed information. 
detailed information gets captured. So you see all of those, right? All the edges. Like when you, when you look at a human face, for example, okay, you have what? Edges. This is one edge. This is one edge. This is edge, edge, edge. All these are called as edges. So the edges get captured using the low level uh, or the initial hidden layers, which captures the low level or detailed information. Then the next set of hidden layers, this is also called as hidden layer. This is capturing probably eye of a person or nose of a person or mouth of a person or ear of a person, so on and so forth. Then you have next set of hidden layer, which is capturing the entire face of the person. And finally, you have output layer, which will classify and tell you what is the name of the person. It will give you the name of the person actually. Okay. So within deep learning, you have neural network algorithm. And this neural network algorithm will have a lot of hidden layers. Okay, and you'll have output layer, you'll have input layer. Initial hidden layer will contain, uh, will capture low level information. Next set of hidden layers will capture mid level details. Then final set of hidden layers will capture high level information. Now, if you look at um, the comparison between deep learning models versus shallow learning models. Shallow learning are all of your other algorithms such as regression, decision tree, random forest, ensemble techniques, naive bees, gain, and all of these are shallow machine learning algorithms. So we have shallow machine learning algorithms as well as deep learning algorithms. When it comes to shallow learning algorithms, you will have to manually extract the features. And when it comes to deep learning models, you're going to automatically extract features. Okay. Either you manually extract the features or you automatically extract the features. And when you have images, what do you do? You apply techniques such as SIFT or, you know, HOG, histogram of Gaussians, uh, shift invariant feature transform, so on and so forth. These techniques are used to manually extract the features from the image. What are the features? Features are nothing but inputs or variables that you use in your data set. If you have a data set, and say that you have an output variable and input variables. These input variables are called as what features? Okay. So what are you doing here? You're trying to take this image and you're trying to extract the features from this image. And once you extract the features and put it in a structured format here, you then take this data and then either build unsupervised learning techniques on this data set or you build supervised learning techniques. Simple. When it comes to speech, if you want to use shallow machine learning algorithms, then you have to manually extract the features. And you, we use 
mel frequency sepstral coefficient that is a technique which people use to extract the features from audio files and once you extract the features once you put it in a structured format then you take that data and you apply unsupervised learning techniques or supervised learning techniques which should be shallow in nature means you apply shallow machine learning algorithms if you have textual data then there is something called as pass through syn um, syntactic you take that you extract the features and then you apply unsupervised learning techniques or supervised learning techniques and finally i mean if it is a classification technique you want to probably look at this and classify whether it is positive or negative right so on and so forth. however when it comes to deep learning models you need not know these techniques why because deep learning algorithms will automatically extract the features from your data there would be automatic feature extraction so what about shallow models if you have the data you are going to hand craft or manually extract the features and on that on, th on those features you build your simple algorithms machine learning algorithms deep learning uh, sorry decision tree random forest ensemble techniques so on and so forth when it comes to deep learning models you just supply your data to your algorithm and it would extract the features it would extract the features and then using those features you build your classifier techniques okay now we are going to spend huge amount of time on uh, this specific slide friends okay so let's understand say you have an output variable and you have various inputs x1 x2 x3 x4 and x5 okay and say you have your historical data say you have 10000 observations and you wanted to predict some output and you have inputs so you want to predict whether a customer is going to churn or not churn and you have various inputs age of the customer gender how many times customer purchased in a specific month what items did the customer purchase so on and so forth and say so you want to classify whether a customer would churn or not churn this is the data that we have how many inputs do we have here five inputs if you have five inputs in the input layer of your neural network in this input layer you're going to have five neurons 1 2 3 4 five neurons but then here we are seeing one more neuron we have five inputs here hence we have five neurons but we also see an additional input what does that mean so if i have the cross marks and say you have the circles how do i segregate these two using a line and what is the equation of this line equation of linus y is equal to mx plus c i can also write it as c plus mx and in regression which we will okay i mean regression in regression analysis you have something called as y is equal to beta not plus beta 1 into x and when it comes to neural networks you have y is equal to b plus 
mx. Okay. Instead of this m, I can write it as wx. Okay. If you want me to represent everything using the work is, I can do. Everywhere you have C or beta naught or B, all these are called as what? Intercept values, constant values. Okay. This is given a special name called as intercept or a constant. And this M or beta one are called as slope. Okay. The C comma M, C and M or beta naught, beta one are also called as parameters or coefficient values. On similar lines, when it comes to neural networks, you have B and W. B and W, they are also called as parameters or coefficient values. Same. They are also called as parameters or coefficient values. And what is multiplied with C or beta naught or B? C or beta naught or B is multiplied with 1. If I multiply it with 1, it will be C. If I multiply 1 with beta naught, I will get beta naught. If I multiply 1 with B, I get B. Right? So that is the reason why you have 1 as an input here. And with a neural network, this B is given a special name called as bias. And W is called as weight. However, these put together are called as weights or parameters. Okay, so I'll remove all these things. So you understand weight that B is coming from. It's coming from the equation of line, which will help classify the two classes. And B is called as bias, and it is multiplied with one. Actually, okay. you have to just allow me. A quick minute, so sorry.
Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Okay, yes. So you have input data and or input layer rather and each of these inputs would be connected to another neuron. And while the connections are established, all these weights are assigned randomly. All these, assi all these weights are initialized randomly. In biological terms, these connections between one neuron to another neuron in your brain is called as dendrite. That's a biological name. For now, I think we need not worry about that. Okay, let me call these as connections. Once the, all these weights are randomly initialized, you perform something called as integration. This is called as integration. And integration functions can be anything. And most widely used integration function is called as summation. Summation. So what do you do? B into 1 is B plus W1 into X1 plus W2 into X2 plus W3 into X3 plus W4 into X4 plus W5 into X5. And when you multiply these, you get some number. When you solve it, you get a number. Say, for example, you got a number which is 0 0.8. Just as an example. You take this integration function and then you supply it as an input to the activation function. So this is called as what? Activation function. This cell body or soma is a term which is given for human, human brain. Yes, we can. Can you unmute it, please? Can you unmute yourself? Sir. Yes, we can. What is your doubt, please? The last the last line is extensive, like uh, the last Why did thing. I give like that in the image to come? Mm. I'm giving you an example of five inputs. Okay. There can be thousand inputs also, or there can be ten thousand inputs also. There can be twenty inputs also, there can be ten inputs also. Okay. Right? Just to tell you that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, in that way, you can have n number of inputs we have given as n. But you are okay. understanding the concept, right, Sita? Uh, yes. Thanks. Okay. If you get 0.8, for example, when you do the summation, you take that value and supply it to the activation. You will have a lot of activation functions. And one simple activation function here that you're seeing is called as a step function. You have something called as a step function. When it comes to step function, if you get this function value, if you get the value of this, if this function value, if this is greater than zero, then output will be equivalent to one. If this function value happens to be less than or equal to zero, then you say that output is equal to zero.
This is how the step function works. Different activation functions work in different ways. Okay. And this step function works in this manner, wherein when you add all these values, if the value, if the summation is greater than zero, output will be one. If this function value is less than or equal to zero, output will be zero. Okay. So here you're getting point 0.8. Point 0.8 means what will be the output? One. So that would be called as your predicted value. One means a customer will churn. Zero means customer will not churn. In the example that we are talking about. So what we do is typically we take the first input. You take all of these uh, first row rather and take all these inputs, pass it through your algorithm. And then calculate the predicted value. Predicted values always have a hat on the top. Now try to compare it with the actual value. What is actual value here? Churn. Say so you predicted that customer will churn. Actually, actual value also says customer will churn. Is this the right prediction? Then take the second row. Take all of these inputs. Pass it through your neural network. Get the predicted value. The predicted value says customer will not churn. What does your actual value say? Not churn. Wonderful. There is again right prediction. If there is going to be right prediction, then there won't be any loss. There won't be any loss, error. There won't be any error. Then take the third row, pass all of these inputs through your neural network algorithm, and then you'll get the predicted value. Say the predicted value says that customer will churn. But what does your actual value here say? Customer will not churn. Is there a match? No. There's a mismatch, incorrect prediction. The moment there is incorrect prediction, there will be loss or error. For each observation in that way, you get loss. Here loss will be zero, here loss will be zero, here you'll have some loss in that way, you'll have loss. How many loss values will you have if you have 10,000 observations here? 10,000 loss values. One of the loss values measures is called as entropy. In decision tree, we spoke about entropy. Entropy is a measure of impurity loss. Okay. So, if you have only two classes, churn, not churn, and only two classes, then it's called as binary entropy, cross entropy. We'll get there anyways. Once you have all these loss values, once you have all the loss values, when you combine all these loss values, probably you'll take an average of all the loss values, and then you got something, you'll get something called as cost value. So all these are called as loss functions. Entropy is one of the loss functions. When you take an average of all those, when you try to aggregate all these loss uh, losses, you'll get something called as a cost value or a cost function. Once you get the cost function, your algorithm will now go back and it will update the weights with the goal or intention to minimize the cost. So you'll have cost which is going to be probably entropy. You have various measures. One measure is entropy. So you have your cost function and your error surface will look like that. Randomly, when the weights are initialized, suppose the weights got initialized here. I'll give you an example of only a single weight, friends, because only if we have single weight can we um, represent in two-dimensional space. I, I can show you using this graph only using one weight. If I have more, if I have another weight, it'll show up like that. A third weight, imagine something going into the computer. 
all those I cannot visualize, right? So I'm taking only one weight just to show you. So suppose the weight got randomly initialized here. What is the loss corresponding to that here? Now, when you go back, your goal will be to update the weights such that you minimize your cost or minimize your loss. So when you update the weights, what will happen to your cost? That would also get reduced. Once again, with those updated weights, move forward, do your predictions, compare it with the actual values, then you'll again get loss values. Aggregate the loss values or take an average, you get the cost. With this cost function in mind, come back and update the weights. So I'll again update the weights. After you update the weights, what will happen to your cost function? Again, it reduces. The cost is reducing. Okay. Again, with these updated weights, with these updated weights, again, do a forward pass. Do what pass? Forward pass. And calculate the predicted values. Compare the predicted values with actual values. You'll get the loss values. Aggregate those to get the cost. Now do a backward pass. And once again, update the weights. The moment you update the weights, once again, the cost value minimizes. Now again, do a, uh, with the updated weights, again do a forward pass, get the predicted values, compare with the actual values, then you get loss function, aggregate to get the cost, go back and again update the weights. This time when you update the weights, probably your cost function value will increase. That is where your algorithm will stop and say that, you know what, if I further update the weights, the cost is increasing. So I would rather stop at these weights because that is giving me the minimum cost value. This process of going forward and coming back to update the weights is called as back propagation algorithm. Back propagation algorithm. What is back propagation algorithm? You go forward. Calculate the cost, come back and update the weights. And the process of minimizing the cost or the algorithm which is used to minimize your cost is called as gradient descent algorithm. It's called as gradient descent algorithm. Gradient is also called as rate of change. Gradient is given another name. And that another name is called as rate of change. Or it is also called as slope. Or it is also called as derivative. All these are the different names provided for gradient. So what is happening to the cost? It is descending, decreasing. The rate of change, is the cost function remaining the same? No, it is descending, it is changing. It is changing in downward direction. It is reducing like this. Hence it is called as gradient descent algorithm. So you have two algorithms here. One is your back propagation algorithm whose objective is to update the weights. And we have gradient descent algorithm whose objective is to minimize the cost function. Okay. There are a lot of activation functions. We'll talk about those later. Okay. Again. I request you all to please stay in the present so that you don't miss out on things. Hmm. 
So this high level picture should be in your brain. Okay. With this high level picture in your brain, we will proceed further with additional discussions. Let me erase these things via some waves. You also understand the integration function and activation function. These are connections. Yes. Now, yes, Sikha. Yes, sir. This is a, a like uh, example for you have explained for the binary classification, right? Yes. Sir, what if like uh, if you use uh, like if, if the data which is having multi classification, like what kind of function will use instead of step function? Activation function is a hyperparameter. What do you mean by hyperparameter? So, like when we are like the model when it is uh, getting overfitting, so in that case, so we'll use hyperparameters and we'll fit the model to. If write. the model is overfitting, do, do you apply regularization techniques or hyperparameters? Mostly, sir, regularization. Not mostly. You apply only regularization techniques. Okay. And a few of the hyperparameters might be called as regularization techniques but not all hyperparameters are regularization techniques what is a hyperparameter by definition hyperparameter is that uh, value or that parameter which can take multiple values so this activation function is a hyperparameter which can take multiple values like your step function uh, you know, bold functions, exponential functions, sigmoid function, tan h functions. There are multiple activation functions. What we need to understand is that the objective of this act activation function is to capture the non-linear relationship. What do you mean by non-linear relationship? Say, for example, you have data like this. If you have data like this, are, are these data points linearly separable? No. Why no? I can draw a line and then segregate these two. They are linearly separable. However, if I give you data like this, Are these data points linearly separable? Can I draw a straight line and segregate yellow class from the pink class? No. No. Okay. So if the, the data underlying data is linearly separable, then do you know what? In the activation function, you can use a linear activation function. When you use linear function, that means you're not going to do anything. Whatever you get in the integration, you supply it as is. This linear function will not do anything. It will take the value here and it will give the same value as output. That, that's the goal of linear function. However, if your underlying data happens to be non-linear, to capture the patterns within this, we use something called as activation function. And one such activation function is step function. Okay, you have various other functions. We'll talk about that. Later. So I didn't use step function just because we had this example of churn and not churn. I used it just to demonstrate this uh, exercise. However, what activation functions should you prefer when your output variable has multiple classes? What activation function should you use when you have two classes? And what activation function do we use when output variable is continuous or numeric in nature? Something that we'll certainly talk about when we get into activation functions. But at a high level, this is what it does. The objective of activation function is to ensure that whenever your underlying data is non-linear, which in most cases will be, 
in most cases your underlying data will be non linear so to capture the patterns of that we use non linear activation functions all right chicken hope that uh, okay sir yeah thank you thank you Certain times, the the questions that you ask, right, will help me explain the concept in a slightly different manner, or probably in a better manner, if I were to say so, so that the concepts become clear for everyone. So I I really appreciate these kind of questions, which probably Venkatesh has asked, and which probably Srikant ha has asked, right. So these kind of questions are really uh, going to clarify doubts of various other. Uh, people who might have that question and probably were not asking me those questions. Okay, thank you so much. I should say that. Okay, I'll complete a uh, a few more things, and I'll explain about uh, the loss and cost function, and I'll explain about a few other things. Uh, so, friends, while this is getting recorded. last time when i've taken master class it was bearing in mind the ai in professional certificate program in data science and ai we have deep learning in ai right there we train students on a lot of advanced algorithms for that a lot of um, you know additional information is needed so that additional information also i covered last time right to that extent we cannot go here because that was for deep learning and ai students so those videos are there in your recommended videos i recommend you to watch those for even a deeper understanding if you want but this session though we are recording it probably you might not even need it because a very very comprehensive version is already made available this is only for the cds students certificate program in data science whatever is needed for you to understand that much amount we will cover but certainly if you want more insights and for people who are switching to pds or people who will continue with pds program for you you will have a lot of additional stuff to read and then your algorithms will be of a different league altogether okay so here within gradient descent algorithm now hopefully you'll be able to also relate it to gradient boosting extreme gradient boosting etc but anyways so within this gradient descent algorithm zone uh, we have something called as um, sgd mini batch is gd and batch gradient descent batch gradient descent stochastic gradient descent and mini batch is gd and then you have iterations and epochs so let's understand more about this what do you mean by batch gradient descent batch gradient descent means in your training data if you have 10000 observations pass each and every row or each and every observation through your network get the predicted values of all those 10000 get the actual values of all the 
for each observation, when you try to compare, you get something called as a loss function. When you aggregate, you get the cost function. Take that cost function, go back and update the weights. Each time you update the weights, it is called as one iteration. Each time you go back and update the weights, it's called as one iteration. If you pass your entire training data set through your network at least once, or once, once if you pass all of the observations through your network, it's called as one epoch. So if I say I want to run 10 epochs, how many times will the weights get updated? 10 times. Okay, so your weights get updated 10 times if you run 10 epochs. Okay, that's batch gradient descent algorithm. While this is on the one side of the spectrum at one extreme, you have another thing which is called as stochastic in CHA. Stochastic gradient descent. Okay, when it comes to stochastic gradient descent, if I say I want to run one epoch, what do you mean by one epoch? You pass all the 10,000 observations once through your network, that is called as one epoch. Stochastic means random. Stochastic as a word means random. So what we do is we are going to randomly choose observations. For example, you randomly choose observation three, take all of these inputs, supply it to all of these and bias will always have one as an input pass it to your network get the predicted value okay so here you are passing observation number three and then you get the predicted value as say churn but actually uh, the, the actual value is customer will not churn so you'll have some loss. For every observation, it's called as loss. You take that loss, go back and update the weights. The moment you update the weights, it's called as one iteration. Then you take another observation, probably 9,999. Take all the inputs corresponding to this entry, pass it to your network. Then do your prediction. Say prediction says customer will not churn. Actual values also say customer will not show. Well, loss will be zero. So it won't basically updates won't happen. Even if it comes back, since there is no loss, weights will remain the same. Then you randomly pick another input. Say second, sorry, randomly pick another observation. Say you picked up the second observation. Take all the inputs corresponding to that, pass to your network, and then you get the predicted value. Say predicted value is churn. Actual value says customer will not churn. So there is a loss. Since there is a loss, you once again go back and update the weights. Again, pick another observation. Now say 10,000. In that way, randomly it is going to choose the observations. And it will pass through the network. And you get the predicted value. Compare it with the actual value. And immediately go back and update the weights. So. How many times will you update the weights in one epoch? One epoch means all the examples, all the observations should be passed to your network once. So in one epoch, how many times are you going to update the weights? In one epoch, how many times will you update the weights? Hmm? How many are there? 10,000. So you're going to update 10,000 times. Because each time you take an observation and pass through, you calculate loss, immediately come back and update the weights. Each time you update it, it's called as one iteration. Go to the next observation. So what are you doing? You are doing it in a random manner. That is why it's called as stochastic gradient descent. 
in batch gradient descent you pass one after another all the 10000 observations calculate the loss for each and every observation aggregate it to get cost then go back and update the weights so one epoch has one iteration in batch in stochastic one epoch means all these 10000 should be passed to your network but randomly one after another you pass and each time you pass calculate loss go back and update so 10000 times you update people thought batch means it is at one extreme where you take everything store all these weights in your memory and then go back and update it's going to be memory intensive and on another side they looked at stochastic which will be very time consuming because each time you keep updating the weights is there a common balance between these two do we have a midpoint that is when people came up with mini batch lcd here you need to define something called as batch size usually batch size will be 2 raised to the power n means your your ram right would be 16 gb 32 gb in that way this is 2 raised to the power 4 that is 2 raised to the power 5 etc hence if you have 2 raised to the power something that's if, if you are going to have your batch size like that you can make use of your complete memory that's the idea okay anyways for our example let's say that we define that batch size is equal to 2500 just as an example how many do we have observations 10000 so what happens is assume that we have 10000 observations so one until 2500 would be called as batch 1 2501 until 5000 would be called as batch 2 then 5001 until 7500 would be called as batch 3 then 7501 until 10000 would be called as batch 4 so since you have 2500 as a batch size how many batches will you have four batches this is your batch 1 batch 2 batch 3 and batch 4 now when your algorithm kicks off it will go to first batch and what is it called as mini batch sgd stochastic gradient descent so in each batch it is going to randomly choose observations so say it will go to observation number 2 it will do the prediction you look at the actual value get the loss store it in memory then randomly say uh, 2500 observation 500th observation is chosen you take the inputs supply it to your network then you get the predicted value compare with the actual and then you get the loss then you pick another observation randomly take the inputs pass it to your network get the predicted value compare it with the actual value you get the loss in that way until you get 2500 loss values for all these observations you keep storing it once you get the data of all 2500 you aggregate it to get the cost function once you get the cost function back propagate and update the weights go back update the weights then go to batch 2 within batch 2 take each observation take the inputs pass it to your network get the predicted value compare it with the actual value you get a loss then take that loss go back and update the weights oh, sorry uh, store it my bad then take next observation take the inputs pass it prediction actual loss keep it store it next observation randomly out of these randomly you keep choosing until you complete all 2500 here also you have 2500 once you complete all of those get the cost function go back and update the weights then go to batch 3 in batch 3 choose randomly the observations pass it to your network 
and keep saving the loss values, aggregate it to get cost, go back and update the wheels. Third time you update the wheels. Then you go to the fourth batch. Again in the fourth batch, randomly choose the observations, pass it through your network, calculate the loss functions, aggregate to get the cost, go back and update the wheels. So with, in one epoch, one epoch means all the observations should be passed once through your network. In one epoch, how many times weights are getting updated? Four times. So the number of iterations will be? These are the three algorithms that you people should be aware of. Mm. I should probably ask you this question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hi. Actually, I uh, have this question. Like, we are taking four or five batch according in uh, mini stock uh, graded descent. So, like, there will be no overlap of the data points. Like, we have created four batches. And we are taking randomly all the data points to mm -hmm. uh, to complete the one epoch. So oh, are you, are you saying that this is batch one, one, two, two thousand five hundred? Okay. Are you saying that in this batch mm -hmm. will I again pass the same observation two times or three times or four times? Is that a possibility? Is that your question? Uh, no, I think uh, my confusion is that four batches. That one batch is different to another batch. Okay. Okay. I got my answer. Then. Yeah, yeah. One batch and the other batch is completely different. Okay. All right. So you now also understand what do you mean by epoch? What do we mean by iteration? What do we mean by all of these? So yet another thing that I want to talk about is about the loss functions. So, let me Okay. For loss function, we are already aware of something called as entropy. And we know the formula for entropy minus summation of i equal to 1 until n pi into log of pi. This two. Okay. Friends, hardly we would have uh, looked into maybe 20 formulae max at the max throughout this training. At least this 20 you have to remember. 20 is not a big deal. You have to remember. Like mean is one, variance is one formula, standard deviation, right? Then we have Bayesian rule formula. We have entropy formula. What else did we learn about? Information game, normalization, uh, correlation coefficient, covariance. These are a few things that you need to remember. Formula part you just remember just to be Rest assured that uh, when interviewers ask these questions, you answer them. One of our student, uh, he was attending McKinsey interview and he was actually asked that it seems. McKinsey uh, is a consulting company which sets very high standards. They pay very high salaries and they also have very high standards. And uh, supposedly they have given a printout with some numbers in it. And they asked him to calculate the variance manually. And they asked him to manually calculate uh, correlation coefficient value. That's a very, very extreme case. People would not do that. But if at all they ask, you should be aware of the basic, at least, I would say the formula will not even be 20, might be 12 or 15 months. 
but by heart those keep it handy from interview standpoint okay now this is entropy right but here we are going to look at something called as cross entropy and within cross entropy you will have a formula why is it called as cross entropy you will understand i equal to on on until n pi into log of qi base 2 this pi is called as actual value this q is called as predicted value entropy is calculated for individual columns for every column you calculate entropy and then using that you calculate something called as information gain how much information do i have in each column each variable each feature those features which have high information is what you'll choose for your model building but here what are you doing in cross entropy you're trying to compare actual values and predicted values hence it is given a name called as cross entropy right and if you have a two class problem like here churn no churn right two class uh, classification problem when you have then we use something called as binary cross entropy and when you have more than two classes that means if you have a multi class problem then we use multiple cross entropy as a loss function multi class uh cross entropy right so let me explain that what do i do shall i erase this thing so that okay suppose you have the actual class and see you are dealing with images tiger lion cat and a dog say you have these four classes and if the new image okay if if this image is of lion in the actual data to we'll say that 0 1 Zero zero. That means this is lion. There's hundred percent confidence that it is lion. It's not tiger. It's not cat. It's not dog because it's a lion. But when you supply this to your prediction model, your prediction model might say that hey, there is twenty percent probability that it is tiger. There is a seventy percent probability that it is lion. there is a 5% probability that it is cat and there is 5% probability that it is a dog these are predicted values the actual values are given a term p predicted values called as q mm -hmm. now multiple class entropy okay multi class classification problem now here you have four right so you write this formula as i equal to 1 until 4 pi into log of q1 when you substitute i equal to 1 in this you get p1 into log of q1 base 2 minus when you substitute i equal to 2 you get p2 p2 into log of q2 minus when you substitute i equal to 3 you get p3 p3 into log of q3 minus when you substitute i equal to 4 you get p4 p4 into log of q4 base 2 p is 0 that is p1 is 0 here so minus 0 into log of q is 0.2 q1 minus p2 is 1 so 1 into log of q2 is 0.7 again everywhere it will be base 
minus. You have P3, which is zero. So you have zero into log of Q3. Q3 is 0 0.05. Minus, you have P4, which is zero into log of Q4 is 0 0.05 base two. Zero into this zero, zero into this zero, zero into this. Finally, you'll get minus log of 0.7 base two. When you solve it, you get some number. That would be called as your loss. This is a calculation for cross entropy when you have multi-class problem. Clear? Okay, couple of other things. If your output variable is continuous, numeric, continuous account, then we use something called as mean squared error or root mean squared error, right? As your loss function. Because when you have output variable which is numeric, you have to subtract. There is no comparison here. You have to subtract the actual value from predicted value. All right, friends. So what we will do at this point of time is take a quick break.